Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And you know, the odd thing about this week is that it felt a little like a holding pattern. There's just so much coming in the pipeline for the next week or two that I don't know how much any of this, what I'm covering this week, will stick out. Not helped by a pretty underwhelming selection of albums yet again. But hey, before we get to all of that, let's get for this week on the Pulse. So we've got seven albums on the docket. Let's go back and talk about from Matt Most, The Consuming Flame, Open Exercises in Group Form. Yeah, I know, I'm late to this one, but of all the electronic acts I've explored in 2020, I think for Matmos I should be afforded the biggest pass, mostly because I have no idea how one could assign a genre label to this duo at all. Seriously, I went through their entire back catalog, and they're a duo that's never seemed to stick with a set sound for all that long, first making a serious mark for me with some glitchy conceptual albums that leaned more towards Folktronica around the turn of the millennium, while in between between the West and the Civil War, they made an album entirely with sounds that were sampled from plastic surgery equipment. I mean, this is the duo that made a record entirely off of sounds from their washing machine that would actually wind up being kind of ingenious, or from various plastic objects around their house. A little less ingenious, to be honest. So it's very easy to dismiss Matmos as just being obscenely quirky, or the music that is so narrowly focused on its conceptual experiment that it forgets to be emotional emotionally engaging. But then you remember in 2006, they made an entire album dedicated to their LGBTQ influences, and you start picking up on a sharper and more insightful core than just artifice. It's similar to a lot of the reasons I like Patricia Taxon stuff in electronic music. And going back through Matmos's catalog, you can spot some of their scattered and eclectic influences on her. That being said, I did have some skepticism about this project, where the twofold gimmick for a project that was nearly three hours long and split into three extended movements was that it involved 99 collaborations and every piece of it had to be at 99 beats per minute. That's a lot, even for an extended scattered project where the wild shifts in tone and sound, they are part of the point in highlighting how the varied spread of electronic music, and humanity symbolically, they might encompass both more and less meaning mashed together on aggregate for capitalist consumption, reflecting the tension that can come amidst group collaboration, and how many colorful interpolations there can be of one mostly loose idea, all with a splash of surrealist unknowability along the way. But I I don't know. I have to wonder if there was a more elegant way to encompass this idea, because there's no real sense of flow or crescendo or sense of coherent internal logic outside of a few very fragmented motifs. Even if I would say by the time you get to the third disc, you can start to hear a little bit more twisted, glitchy method in all the madness. And you know what, for every cool sounding fragment or recognizable collaborator, the clipping and one of Trick's point never passages, they stuck out to me. But you'll also get some jagged bursts of quirk or passages that just dribble into the background, where it will draw your attention only to alienate you a minute later. And I don't want to even say this resist analysis, because the subtextual themes and the textural experience of the thing, they're not hard to pinpoint or get through, but it also has the feel of a video game puzzle that's unnecessarily long and kind of obtuse and doesn't leave you feeling all that clever for having solved it. And that's not even saying that any of the movements are bad or boring or poorly produced because as an experience it is a fascinating listen and one that I will recommend but I gotta be honest if I've got a high concept electronica triple album I'll go back to in 2020 it'll be from Patricia Taxon. Stream of Light 7 out of 10, more because it ends well and has enough intriguing high points for me to err on the side of positive but I would not say this is their best. And yes, the washing machine album is better. Don't at me. Next up from Armani Caesar, The Liz. I'm blanking out on all of these dip shit. Top of my head lit. Hustle game, I'm on my tip shit. Going hard, I'm on my stiff dick. Well, 
I did say I want to be more on top of the Griselda releases, and this is one I've been intrigued by for a little bit. It's not Armani Caesar's official debut album, but it is her first under the Griselda umbrella, and that left me very curious how she was going to position herself within that crew, especially on a project that will run under a half hour. And here's the thing, in a way, you could see this as just another Griselda album. Solid bars, a cushion of lush, slightly off-kilter samples behind slow, bassy grooves and percussion, but content that's not really transcending expectations, just swapping out all the signifiers of male gangster rap success with those for women. But honestly, that might be enough to give Armani Caesar a little bit more runway, because I found myself enjoying this pretty short project a decent bit. She picks out some slinkier, groovier production as a whole. Her slow burn, sneering delivery feels violently authentic and imaginative without becoming a manic cartoon presence, as a lot of her peers in the mainstream can become, male and female. And most importantly, she sounds and feels comfortable in this lane and alongside the other Griselda members. Hell, she can hold her own opposite Benny and Conway, and I actually think she's better than West Side Gun, and both her songs with Benny the Butcher on this album, Drillarama, and the DJ Premier produced Simply Done, they're some of the collective's best works they put out this year. Now again, if you know your history of women in gangster rap for the past 20 or so years, nothing that she delivers will really surprise you. Her flow is pretty punchy and well-structured, but nothing that's gonna blow your mind. And the whole get your own money, blow off, or kill guys who are not to your standard, that arc is nothing out of the ordinary or super in-depth or really implying a lot more. But let's be fair, the Griselda Collective have struggled to find that added layer of depth across the board. I'm not gonna hold that against her here. Now, I do think the abbreviated rum time does this a little bit of a disservice, though, especially when a few samples, they can run a little bit long. And I would like to hear a little bit more in terms of diversity of her sound or more of a chance being taken. But that being said, I appreciate seeing an artist settle in into their lane and lay down a good foundation, and this absolutely does. And also winds up being pretty damn likable as a result. So uh, yeah, this light seven out of 10. I like this. If you're curious, definitely take the time, check it out. Next up from Asian Dub Foundation, Access Denied. It's not a yes or no answer, be prepared. Cause this thing in the future. Okay, this is a weird one, and another case where I'm stepping a little out of my comfort zone a bit, but where the group is kind of worth discussing. Asian Dub Foundation, unsurprisingly, is a UK group that dabbles in dub, but also a fair amount of breakbeat, UK hip-hop, and alternative rock. This is the sort of genre pile-up you can get away with in the mid-90s, and even see a bit of success with it, especially if you had a modestly conscious angle, which did have a decent UK-inspired sardonic edge. But also also, given how hard this group slid in the 2000s, I'd argue they kind of hit their peak a little early and can feel kind of dated now. That being said, their 2015 album was a fair bit more fun than it had any right to be, and thus here... Uh, I don't know. Why do I get the feeling that this group hasn't really budged or shifted its sound or approach all that much since the 90s? Yeah, the percussion and blending is cleaner, which is not precisely a good thing. This is an album that really could have afforded a more rugged blend of the guitars and the woodwinds with the bass grooves and percussion, and the horns, and especially the acoustic guitar, they really sound canned. And you know what? You might hear traces of a trap progression if you're listening for it on a couple of songs, but outside of a monologue from Greta Thunberg that sadly at this point should not feel as cliche as it does, this album probably could have dropped in the late 90s or the early 2000s and not much would have changed or varied since then. Now part of this is the sad reality that a lot of the leftist complaints surrounding capitalism, nationalism, gentrification, racism, and climate change, they haven't had impetus to change since the 90s because the problems haven't gone away. But if I'm bringing back my criteria for great political art, while this album certainly feels very populist, I'd struggle to say it's got a ton of precision if the content doesn't really update a bit with more modern detail, or if the rapping and clean singing rarely bring forth any sort of fiery intensity you would get if
in modern hardcore punk or hip hop or rap rock. Hell, what might have been the most pointed and cutting piece on the entire project was chopping up comedian Stuart Lee's savage criticism of long running British xenophobia on coming over here. And even then, a lot of the sizzling gurgle of synths that are sprayed around him really are not as impressive as they could be with their impact. And considering a fair chunk of this album will then just go for sporadic breakbeat electronic rock instrumentals thereafter, I'm just not all that convinced it's a good thing. Look, even as it is, I think it's fine. Even if I don't feel nostalgic for this sound, it might play better to a British audience. But considering the intensity surrounding all the politics right now, and having been lodged in this place for decades, it just doesn't have much teeth to me. Light 6 out of 10, only if you're curious. Next up from Knuckle Puck 2020. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be that surprised this wound up on my schedule, but there is a reason that acts sitting adjacent to what would have been the warp Tour scene don't tend to get a lot of interest from me. Once you become accustomed to the basic sound and expectations, there's not a lot for me to really say. Now, I will say of this group, Knuckle Puck does stand out a bit more. The vocals can be a little more visceral. There's a bit more diversity in mix depth, a few better hooks on average. And while they really don't approach the heights of where pop punk and especially emo have gone in recent years, I mean, they're not touching the Wonder Years or Spanish love songs, for instance, here. They're solid enough. I thought their project in 2017 was pretty okay. And yet I should qualify all that by saying they really don't break that playbook, especially on this new album 2020, which actually steps away from some of the darker emo touches to double back on the pop punk and along the way get considerably less interesting and picking up some questionable cymbal mixing to boot. And thus, the best way for me to evaluate an album like this is saying, well, okay, what helps it stand out from the pack? Honestly, not a lot. I think Earthquake and Green Eyes Polarized are both decent love-struck tunes with a bit of an okay scuzzy rollick. I don't mind the quasi-political kiss-off on RSVP. That's a nice call-out to a scene that doesn't get that many of them. And I don't mind the loose thematic arc of trying to cope and find those in your life who will support you on that journey or not with the final couple songs even have their eyes even towards God herself. But outside of that, there's just very little here that's all that distinct or memorable, even despite the energy. This album fell into the background way too often for me for a pop punk release, and I gotta be honest, I'm not gonna look back on it much. Six out of 10, that's being generous. Next up from Movements, No Good Left to Give. Cause every single night I see you fight to keep Oh, we're getting two of these bands this week. All right, look, to be fair, I don't slot movements into the Warp Tour band demo, even if ironically my first exposure to them came at Sonic Temple last year. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of kicking myself I didn't get to their debut album from 2017, as this is a blend of post-hardcore and emo that I could potentially get into, with enough of the former's instability and some odd chord choices blended with the rawness and the accessibility of the latter that I found myself really liking Feel Something, even if I got the impression that this is absolutely a band that's got a lot of room to grow from rock-solid fundamentals. And the more I listen to this project, well, the more I came back to some very rock-solid fundamentals, but not a lot that set them above beyond, oh wow, this band really wants to be La Dispute, up to and including using their producer from Panorama. Now look, this in and of itself is not a bad thing. La Dispute is fantastic. They're the group that got me into post-hardcore from a live performance. Movements have worked with Will Yip before anyway, and it is an ambitious target for a band starting out, but it's also more obvious where they fall short, and we should start with the themes, where the lead singer has described this feeling that you can't offer anything more to your partner, and they'd just be better off if you were dead. Now, I'm not saying you can't make something out of a theme that is this depressing, but that was only a fraction of some of the thematic complexity and lyrical color on, I don't know, Panorama just last year, and by the time we get to Don't Give Up Your Ghost and Expose Her Deep-Seated Angst, 
I'm stuck with the feeling that we have been down this rabbit hole before, just this time it feels weirdly self-consumed and a lot more faintly toxic with more basic language. And yes, it's what you would expect in a situation where the relationship is very obviously self-destructive. And for the second half of the album, it actually is implied there's a messy breakup of some kind, and the album does get a little bit more interesting as he tries to parse through his very mixed feelings about it and whether or not it was the right thing and he has got to move on. But more often than not, you get the impression this album is more interested in wallowing in angst than finding the roots of any of it. And a lot of the language tilting towards melodrama doesn't really help matters. And I say all that because when you consider the actual sound of this album, well, not only can it not really match its inspirations in terms of textures or hooks or firepower or intensity, but it's also got a very monochromatic reverb out grinding post-hardcore drudgery that doesn't really help when the writing tilts towards melodrama, nor a lot of flashy hooks or spark to really stand out. It's not saying it isn't well produced, because for the most part it is. The bass and guitar, they've got sizzle, the vocals are well placed, there's actually a fair bit more melody at the forefront that I do like. It certainly is accessible post-hardcore, but again, it is solid on the cusp of being better, rather than being great. So... Ugh, strong 6 out of 10. I wish a lot more of this stuck out to me. Next up from Napalm Death, Throws of Joy in the Jaws of Defeat. <laughs> surprised I haven't had the grindcore conversation before now. Hell, I'm surprised this is my first time talking about Napalm Death, given how quintessential the band's legacy is to the scene, specifically their first two albums. So I'll start by saying this. If there is a genre in which I've got a lot more luck appreciating them live over on record, it'd be grindcore. The experience is more immediate and intense, and more importantly, you don't have to deal with the questions of awful production, which is where we really kind of have to start with Napalm Death. Because I think the first two albums are pretty great for what they are in kickstarting the genre, but by the early 90s, they kind of went death metal and recruited some outside producers, and the results were very mixed to say the least. I'd argue by the time the 2000s rolled around, they actually started to get a fair bit more tuneful in order to match a lot of their really explosive aggression, which has not let up. But really, what I found most effective in telling Napalm Death albums apart is just the quality and timbre of their mixes. As when it came to the content and delivery, they really do not vary the formula all that much. This is a band that's got that one trick that they hammer really effectively. But as such, my favorites over the past 20 or so years wound up being 2005's The Code is Red, Long Live the Code, 2009's Time Waits for No Slave, and I'll say 2015's Apex Predator Easy Meat. And thus going into this album, I gotta be brutally honest, I was not all the way enthused with this. Yeah, it's Napalm Death, you know exactly what you're gonna expect with this, and if you like the formula, you'll find this really good. But my frustration comes is that when they do vary the formula on the album, they nearly always get slower and clunkier, or try for a bombast that has never fit this group well. And none of it amplifies the elements that make Napalm Death kick ass for what they are. The quasi accessible radio record on this project Amoral, it's proof of that, especially in comparison with some of the other songs here. Because, you know what, there are hardcore and grindcore acts that have taken a lot of the templates that Napalm Death laid down decades ago and have gotten even wilder and rougher. Look at that Gulch album from earlier this year and how punishingly groove-driven and deceptively tuneful it is. And I'm not sure this album's got the texture or roiling firepower to match it. The grooves being cleaner probably don't help. Now, normally, this is where I would go to the content from Napalm Death, because I do think they are better and smarter writers than they're often given credit, and man, I really wish I liked it more, because about half of it is really smart and politically charged and pretty well considered, but then the other half has this brutal, quasi-reactionary vibe that can feel borderline accelerationalist, and it can feel more than a little clunky. That curse of being in thrall literally has a hook where they just scream the word shitting, which doesn't quite 
hammer down the impact that they think it does. It doesn't have that load. And I guess I shouldn't be surprised by this angle from Napalm Death, especially as outside of Amoral, they aren't really quite as nihilistic. But it comes from the same part of me that sees the title of this album and then makes a subconscious comparison to Joy as an Act of Resistance by Idols, which hit that riotous sweet spot for me a lot more effectively. But as it is... It's a solid 6 out of 10. You've heard a lot like this before. It'll probably play a lot better live, but it was just pretty good to me. Not great. And finally, from Ava Max, Heaven and Hell. Little bit psycho, at night she's screaming. I'm on my mind, on my mind. Oh, she's hot but a psycho. So left but she's right though, at night she's screaming. I'm on my mind, on my mind. I've been joking about this debut album not coming out for, well, about eight months now. Because, look, as much as I like Sweet But Psycho, that is not a single you build your career on. And I was noticing how Ava Max hadn't seen a lot of singles traction until by some miracle Kings and Queens broke through in the United States. She's had a bit more success in the UK, for anyone who cares. But look, I had no reason to expect this would be all that good or interesting. Hell, I was reminded of Katy Perry's long trek to releasing Smile a couple weeks ago, and She's a proven hitmaker for over a decade, which Ava Max is not. And yet, I had a lot of fun with this. Maybe it was just the really low expectations I had. The assumption that we were going to get some not particularly well-produced, bouncy, but gummy dance pop with a frankly distressing amount of ABBA and Lady Gaga influence. But in a bizarre way, this album kind of reminds me of the same appeal you would get from a late 2000s Katy Perry project, and that it is kind of tasteless and melodramatic, but it hits that sweet spot where that actually works to its favor. Now, granted, Ava Max is a considerably better singer and is trying a lot harder than it seemed like Katy Perry ever was, but that slight tinge of desperation kind of reminds me of why I stuck on that Tove Lobe bandwagon as long as I did. And to me, it didn't become obtrusive. Plus, this album has got some of that Cherry Tree Records bombast that peppered the turn of the decade, and while that subset of dance pop probably never got much respect, off times for good reason, I can't deny when it works here. That being said, low expectations may have been met, but they sure as hell were not being exceeded. This album is absolutely more reliant on its samples and interpolations than it should be. Sweet But Psycho is probably the best song here, but it's also probably the only cut with production that doesn't show the signs of overcompression, which is kind of bizarre considering Circuit produced pretty much the entire album, but he also showed that he put the most effort on the singles. And as much as Ava Max wants to frame the first half of this album as being more aspirational, the heaven side, while the back half is more capricious and melodramatic and going to hell, her lyrics really do not do enough to sell the difference. It's not like the vulnerability of Naked and So Am I are that much different, and the sound sure as hell is not. I will say, if Ava Max wanted to slip in the growing early 2000s pop nostalgia wave, a cut like Call Me Tonight will absolutely fit there, and I think I'll stick up for songs like Born for the Night, Rumors, and Take It to Hell regardless. But thus, yeah, you know what, screw it. Light 7 out of 10, I had fun with this. It was a really pleasant surprise. I'm happy she actually got it released. If you're curious at this point, it's worth a listen. Give her a shot. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. I know I probably got some surprising opinions and undoubtedly contentious ones. Comment sections down there. Have fun. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved in my scheduling process, given the week of insanity that is to come, link to my Patreon is right over there. Please do not feel obligated. I understand it's really tough times for a lot of folks, especially with the second wave coming. But hey, if you want to, there's your opportunity. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching On The Pulse on Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.